Hello, everyone, and welcome to Story Lab by Exprim, a new series of interviews aiming to become the place where professional and personal stories come together, melting in just one experience. We will have very interesting uh, uh, guests here talking with us every week, another person. Uh, I assure you that uh, it will be uh, a very interesting thing. And I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can be posted with all the novelties. Uh, today, we will start with our, with our first guest and I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Karel van Hule. Uh, I know he doesn't need actually any introduction, but still, uh, it is my duty to say that uh, currently Karel is Associate Professor at the Economics and Business Faculty of KU Leuven and uh, Honorary Professor of Goethe University of Frankfurt. But Karel has also a very long and rich career in uh, the uh, insurance and pensions industry uh, especially in the regulatory area of this uh, uh, industry. Welcome, Karel. Very happy to have you here as our first guest. Thank you, Daniela. And good day, everybody. Well, uh, as I said, your career encompasses a very long period during which you have worked in the regulatory field. In fact, you have headed the insurance and pensions at the European Commission. And uh, uh, in that period, your main task was developing the Solvency II regime. And uh, well, it's a common place already, but uh, being called the father of the Solvency II, I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quite uh, right for you. And considering this experience, uh, I would like to ask you what are your personal comments uh, about the reviewing process that Solvency 2 is now uh, in uh, course and uh, what um, could be the potential outcome of the AOPA initiative uh, considering uh, the results you have already seen at this point. Well, thank you very much, Daniela, and, and again, good day, everybody. Uh, as Daniela said, uh, I am often referred to as the father of Sol C2, and uh, you can see that already the fact that my beard is uh, gray and that I'm wearing glasses, uh, which is the result of having to read thousands and thousands of pages and spending many, many hours and days in, in, in sometimes difficult negotiations. But Looking ahead now at what is to come, which is the Sol C2 review, I think it is important to always keep in mind that Sol C2, the new Sol C regime, has worked well. And even in times of serious stress, as we have seen uh, by this uh, pandemic, uh, there is no need, therefore, for a fundamental review of the Sol C regime. This is also recognized by EOPA. As you know, EOPA delivered its opinion in December last year, and it states very clearly in the introductory part that it does not see any reason to fundamentally change Solvency II. That's also the view of the European Commission. It's also the view of the European insurance industry. So that's the first important thing to keep in mind. Let's not change things that do not need to be changed. That's always important to, uh, to remind you of that when you are a, a regulator. On the basis of the call for advice from the European Commission, EOPA made a number of proposals which were published in its opinion uh, that was released in December uh, last year. Some of these proposals have been welcomed by the insurance industry while others have been severely criticized. For instance, the proposals relating to the risk margin, the volatility adjustment, and the extrapolation. Industry also wants a number of calibrations to be further reduced, particularly the capital charges for long-term investments. Another controversial issue are the proposals 
concerning macro prudential supervision. EOPA would like the Solvency regime to be further complemented by at the addition of new supervisory tools in order to take care of systemic risk. One of the examples that's been given is the possibility for supervisory authorities to restrict the distribution of dividends in cases of crisis, as we have seen during this pandemic. EOPA also wants to introduce a regime for recovery and resolution and for insurance guarantee schemes. After EOPA has published its opinion, the ball is now in the camp of the European Commission. It is for the European Commission to find the right balance between supervisory considerations and industry concerns. And I can tell you out of experience, to find the right balance in regulation is one of the toughest things you can do. In this regard, it is important to keep in mind that things have fundamentally changed since the development of Solvency II at the beginning of this century. The economic situation, first of all, has changed dramatically. I do remember in 2007, when we published the first proposal for Solvency II, that considerations about low interest rates were not on the top of our minds. We never envisaged that we would come to live in a time of low interest rates, even negative interest rates. So this first thing that needs to be recognized in this reform is that the economic situation has changed. The first adaptation was already necessary in 2014. And you may recall the very difficult negotiations on Omnibus II, which produced the so-called long-term guarantee package. And that package was, was introduced in the Solvency II Framework Directive by Omnibus II, so as to reduce the volatility in own funds, in technical provisions resulting from this low interest rate environment. Well, these measures have helped, but it is clear that further changes are necessary, particularly in the application of the volatility adjustment and in the calibration of interest rate risk, because this calibration of interest rate risk does not take into account the option that these interest rates would actually become negative. Secondly, there is the political agenda. Economic recovery after the pandemic and an ambitious climate agenda. Both objectives call for a stimulation of long-term investments. It would not be responsible to lose the opportunity of the first major review of Solvency II for making those changes in the Solvency regime that help insurers to focus their investment portfolio on investments that contribute to addressing important challenges, such as there are achieving economic growth, technological innovation, addressing climate change, and the aging society. Promoting, promoting these long-term investments, which are so necessary if you want to get out of the difficulties of this pandemic, and if we want to prepare future generations for a better world, promoting these long-term investments without ignoring or underestimating the risks associated with them, that is the way to go. But finding the appropriate solution for this will not be easy. And I am sure that the Commission's proposals will only be the start of a very difficult negotiation in the Council and in the European Parliament. Thirdly, besides the economic situation that has been changed, which requires an adaptation of the Solvency II framework, the political agenda, which is new, there, also, there is also a need to address 
the complexity of the regulatory framework. And I do not need to say to the insurers that Solm C2 is complex. You know this very well. Ways and means must be found to give more emphasis to the principle of proportionality. Proportionality should be a right for insurers. Insurers that are not complex should be able to apply less complex requirements. To get this into the Solm C2 framework will not be easy, but it is a must. And I think there is sufficient political pressure today to move forward in this area. Europa has made some proposals, and I think they are a good basis for this discussion. Attention must also be paid in this reform to avoid an excess of prudence. Europa already announced in its opinion that they want this review to be balanced. And by balanced, they mean they do not want to increase capital charges too much as part of this review. It is, however, understandable that supervisors want to operate a prudent solvency regime. After all, the objective of this regulation is to protect policyholders. On the other hand, a regime that is overly prudent leads to higher premiums, which is not in the interest of policyholders. It would therefore be good to have another look at some calibrations, for instance, for real estate, for long-term investments, both in equity and in debt instruments, and for look at the formula for the calculation of the risk margin the risk margin, which in its present calculation is rightly seen, I believe, by the insurance industry as introducing excessive prudence. Personally, I do not see the urgency for introducing macro prudential tools in, in order to address systemic risk. This is not the main issue on the agenda today. I understand that EOPA wants the EU to adopt a solution for recovery and resolution that is in line with the holistic framework for macro prudential supervision adopted by the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. I would, however, prefer this to be introduced gradually and not at once, and to apply in these new rules a very strong dose of proportionality. Equally, on insurance guarantee schemes. I do not see an urgency to introduce this now. There have been a number of insurance failures in the last couple of years, and they have shown the disadvantage of not having a backup regime in favor of policyholders in all EU member states. As you know, we have insurance guarantee schemes in a number, about 50%, of the member states, which means that if you happen to be a policyholder in a member state without insurance guarantee schemes, you got bad luck. That's not a good system, obviously. But I believe that what we should do first is to make sure that particularly in cross-border sales of insurance, that we have a good cooperation between home and host supervisory authorities. And there is still improvement possible in this area. I believe that prevention is therefore better than to now introduce a remedy that can act as a backup mechanism, but which will be very difficult, even if it is kept at a minimum harmonization level as proposed by EOPA. For me, finally, Daniela, the Solm C2 review will be success when it goes beyond the correction of technical imperfections. It's not a time now to lose ourselves in endless technical discussions on specific technical issues. This review should make it possible for the insurance industry to do better, to make a real contribution to a more sustainable society and to address the still existing protection gaps. This will require courage 
of all parties concerned. But we need to go at it and go at it as quickly as possible because the challenges are there and they will not go away. Well, uh, what you have just said uh, brings me an additional question for you. Uh, the regulatory uh, process uh, in Europe is not known for his speed. Rather, it's known as being long and uh, difficult and uh, involving a lot of negotiations between different stakeholders. But life, it's a little bit uh, going forward at a higher speed. Do you think that there is the possibility to reconcile somehow the, the need of improving the regulatory frame in the, in the time framework available so that the, the regulatory regime is not behind the, the life itself? Well, that, Daniela, is an eternal challenge for regulators. Regulation co always comes after the facts. It's very difficult to predict, to foresee the future and to regulate for that. But to come back to your point about the fact that European negotiations might take a long time, let's not be mistaken about this. I do remember personally a number of reforms that were developed at national level and took far more time. One of the advantages of the European Union is that you have so many parties involved that it is difficult for one party to block the reform, which at national level is often the case. Sometimes you cannot do anything nationally because the number of parties is too small and one of them does not want to play the game. That in Europe is much less likely. And uh, if I could make an estimation about the timing of this process, the SOLZI2 review, I would say that it's not unlikely that the Commission will come forward with its proposal already by the end of July, which is sooner than initially planned. There will be a lot of political pressure to move forward because you can imagine once we get through the troubles of the pandemic, which I hope will be sometime in the autumn of this year, then there will be people are talking about the roaring 20s, that people want to enjoy life, there'll be lots of economic activity, in many countries booming again. And that's the time that we need to spend then on reforms, economic reforms, which require investments. And the insurance industry, which combines about 11 trillion euros of investments, should play a major role in investing then in the real economy. And for that, the Sol C2 regime needs to be adapted. So a lot of political pressure leading to these negotiations to go fairly quickly, I would estimate uh, a year and a half. And then of course, the directive, which will be amended, must be implemented by member states. And that takes time. And experience shows that even if parties want member states to move more quickly, member states will not do that. Member states have their po political processes Maybe governments will fall in between. So you have to give member states two years for implementation. So basically, the reform will start to apply 2025 to 2026. But I would not exclude that parts of it, maybe relating to these long-term investments, will operate more quickly. So Daniela, let's hope that we can move swiftly here but your dream of regulation always coming ahead of the developments, I must say, keep that dream, but that's a dream for heaven. Yeah, or maybe for future generations. Uh, I love the image that you have uh, uh, pushed uh, up a few minutes ago of this 
boost of activity in the post-pandemic uh, era. And uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed mentally thinking of uh, such an uh, atmosphere. And uh, that uh, brings me to my next question, because uh, um, we are one we already one year in this special situation of the crisis created by the pandemics. And uh, I think besides adjusting to the moment, uh, there are some changes in the industry that will survive this moment, will remain uh, forever maybe. And uh, this is what I would like you uh, to focus on. What will, what uh, this crisis has brought and will remain with us even after the crisis will end? Well, yes, Daniela, uh, I can only confirm that with you, I would hope that this pandemic can be called past uh, as quickly as possible. And coming to insurance, obviously, we have to recognize that insurers weathered this pandemic storm rather well. But it has and will be an important wake-up call. On the positive side, we have seen a transformation in the insurance industry. Operating virtually suddenly became normal. It is likely that this digitalization will continue in the future. That should ultimately reduce the cost of insurance and make it possible for insurers to better address the concerns of policyholders through direct virtual contacts. It is impressive how insurers and supervisors were capable of operating almost normally in a fully locked down environment. If we would have had to plan this, ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you, we would not have succeeded. But the forces were there and it worked. Of course, operating in a virtual environment, as it will continue in the future, raises a number of important issues. And those issues are addressed in the EU's digital agenda. And I would certainly want you to keep an eye on this digital agenda that's being developed as I speak, because that should prepare the financial industry for the important changes that result from digitalization. And I can only mention issues like data protection, cybersecurity protection, and things like that, issues we are talking about now more often than we used to do. That's the positive side. I think if the insurance industry plays its role well, the relationship with, with policyholders could improve considerably. And that is something that we should be looking forward to. On the negative side, however, I must say that I was very disappointed to see that many insurers showed little empathy for their policyholders during this major crisis. Obviously, you might think immediately at the issue of business interruption. Business interruption, an area of insurance that was apparently underestimated in its importance, but in a full lockdown environment, many small and medium-sized businesses were suffering so much that many of them will not even survive. Well, insurers just said, you're not covered because we have this pandemic exclusion in the contract. That, I must say, was very disappointing. Obviously, if the exclusion clause was clear, it is difficult not to apply the exclusion. But in many cases, the contract terms were not clear. 
And insurers, rather than to show empathy to the policyholder, they just said, we interpret this in our favor. And so policyholders were not covered. This will result, has resulted, and will continue to be debated in the courts for a number of years to come. But there are other cases than business interruption. And I think notably at policies like travel insurance or cancellation insurance, where people, you and I, were also covered and were faced with the question that the policy that we had bought to protect ourselves against distress, that we called on that policy, we got a message. I'm sorry, not covered. That is, of course, a very unfortunate situation. Of course, there are exceptions. There are exceptions, there are cases, notable case of insurers that did show mercy, that did apply partial or complete full coverage, even in cases where they could have jumped out of the contract. And that, of course, should be lauded. These insurers show that they care about their policyholders. Going forward, I believe that insurers should learn from this exercise. They should learn to show mercy, to show empathy at times of distress for their policyholders. Because in the end, policyholders are their largest treasure. If people do not do not anymore buy insurance, uh, if people do no longer trust insurers to pay, when things go wrong, they won't buy insurance anymore. And this cannot be in the interest of the insurance industry. That is an important lesson uh, from COVID-19. This also means that the terms of insurance policies should be clear so that insurance buyers know what is covered and what is not covered. To me, this raises again the question of insurance advice. It will always remain difficult to buy the right insurance policy without reliance on proper advice. Intermediaries will continue to have an important role to play in this respect. They will have to advise people how to protest, protect themselves best against risks. Insurance is so complicated that it is very difficult for people to know how to buy the right insurance policy. So insurance advice will continue to be important going forward. Now, technically speaking, it is not possibly for the insurance industry alone to bear the cost of a partial or total lockdown of the economy. However, this must be clear from the outset. It's therefore important to build on a system of what EOPA refers to as shared resilience. A system which is based first on a well-functioning insurance regime with clear policies as a start followed by a private-public partnership arrangement for covering the tail losses. It would be good to start thinking about this now and not, as we tend to do as human beings, to wait until we have the next crisis. For most insurers, the damage resulting from COVID-19 was bearable. Most damage occurred in non-life insurance. It's still unclear what the impact of COVID-19 will be on health insurance and life insurance. People who were hit by the pandemic may suffer continuing health problems. It's not clear yet, but we see today that people that recovered from the pandemic sometimes still have a lot of health problems going forward. And indeed, mortality tables may have to be changed. Now, COVID-19 shows, and that's a very important lesson, 
It shows how uncertain the future is and how difficult it is to model the unknown. It's not unlikely that we will see other black swans become white and that more quickly than we had expected. So these are some of the lessons that I see coming out of COVID-19, Daniela. Yes, I would uh, remain with the conclusion, conclusion that uh, this crisis have shown us that uh, we should always imagine uh, events with a higher impact that they have ever had. Because I remember the, the insurance industry was discussing about this possibility of having a pandemic event before, many years before, but I think nobody has imagined such a dimension and uh, such uh, global impact uh, on the industry, but on the life in general. However, it, uh, the good point is that uh, uh, in the end, uh, I think that uh, insurers have managed to to perform an honorable <laughs> position uh, towards their, their partners, the uh, policyholders. And of course, in the future, they can uh, be better prepared with something similar, which uh, brings us to another uh, topic related to huge events, the climate change and its impact on the on the net, net cat risks and how the insurance industry can uh, contribute not only to reducing the protection gap, this is a already long lasting uh, uh, point of its agenda, but also can contribute in its quality of investor uh, to discourage polluting industries, encourage green industries, uh, and so uh, helping the, the uh, works of those entities who are striving to reduce the, the climate change impact. What possibilities are here for the industry? Well, again, risks and challenges bring opportunities. And uh, climate change is something that's already happening. It's not something that we have to work in order to deal with it in the future. It's happening as I speak. Uh, when I woke up this morning, my garden was covered with snow. And last week we had 22 degrees. This is climate change. The impact on our lives, the impact on nature is tremendous. We see that in the increase and intensity of natural catastrophes, floodings, windstorms, fires, they have become the new normal. Natural catastrophe models must be continuously adapted and they're likely to become quickly outdated as the past is no longer a good predictor of the future. We need, Daniela, we need to reduce our footprint on nature. The insurance industry can play a very important role in this respect. On the asset side, insurers are major investors, institutional investors. They should reorient their investments in the direction of more durable investments. There are plenty of opportunities already now, and the opportunities are likely to increase further. As governments will be looking for support from the private sector for carrying out the massive infrastructure investments that are needed in order to achieve the goals set by the Paris Climate Agreement. And I refer back to what I said earlier on 
on the Solency II review. This matter is very high on the political agenda. Finding ways and means to get insurers as institutional investors more engaged in this political process towards realizing the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Of course, climate, the environment, is only one aspect of a broader discussion, which we should not forget about sustainability. If you want to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and that's the clear political intention of all governments of the European Union, investments must also respect the social and governance aspects of sustainability. By imposing ESG reporting requirements, and ESG refers to environment, social, and governmental, governments are forcing insurers to show publicly to what extent they are serious about moving in the direction of a more sustainable society. And this is a good example in regulation where regulators try to achieve a behavior not by imposing something, but by imposing disclosure about actions. Actions to be carried out by the insurance industry, which they have to show in their reports that they are serious about it and that they are carrying this out. In order to make this a credible exercise, the EU adopted a taxonomy and this taxonomy can indicate to what extent investments are responsive to these ESG uh, goals and requirements, as is the intention. I see a number of positive developments in this area. Rating agencies are already now rating insurers depending on their ESG investment records. Insurers announced publicly that they are no longer investing in certain industries, such as coal or oil. More can, however, be done. And I think it is important that insurers do realize that they can do this now already. They should not wait until governments require them to change. On the liability side, things are more complicated. Refusing to underwrite is something that is foreign to any insurer. It is their business to underwrite. It's not their business to refuse to underwrite risks. However, moving out of polluting industries is a very strong mechanism to force these industries to seek alternative ways of operating. And this development should take place, but it can only take place gradually. It should start by insurers insisting on preventive measures before they commit to underwrite the related business risks. And in that sense, insurers can play a major role, which is in their interest. First of all, making sure that risks do not happen. And then, of course, in the eventuality that these risks might happen, to then underwrite the, that risk. Movement in this area is slow, although a number of large insurers and reinsurers have publicly announced that they are changing their underwriting strategy. There is a grouping already of insurers which have made this as a code of honor that they will change their underwriting policy so as to be more sustainable friendly in their activities. And I think that is promising. From a prudential perspective, ESG developments should be monitored carefully. It does not make sense, and that will have to be repeated often when we talk about the Salt City Review. It does not make sense to promote investment in green assets when these assets are more risky. Insurers must invest in the interest of policyholders. But that means that insurers must also take account of transition risks. Continuing an investment strategy without recognizing that investments might become more risky because of the transition 
towards a more sustainable economy is risky in itself. So this transition risk must also be recognized. Supervisors, including EOPA, have stressed this already for a number of years. But similarly, underwriting business risks in polluting industries might not only be risky by itself, but it might also become a source of litigation going forward. And that's another important message for the insurance industry. It is obvious that this transition towards a more sustainable society requires a close cooperation between insurers and supervisors. And of course, that close cooperation between insurers and supervisors, as might be organized by regulation, will only work if society as a whole shows more commitment to moving towards a more sustainable society. And that might come forward as a result of natural catastrophes that we see happen more regularly and which persuade people that they need to change. But human beings are slow to change. And let's hope that this time we take the challenge for our planet seriously and that we help and stimulate the financial sector to play its role in achieving this transition, which is there to save the world in the end. Well, I hope it will be like that, uh, if not uh, for other reasons, but for the benefit of the future generations of our children to live in a pleasant world. And uh, speaking about future generations, uh, here I'm going to my ending question for you because you are at the top of a very long career, uh, mostly in the regulatory field, but I wouldn't uh, want to disconsider your teaching career. You have seen lots of young people preparing for, the, for, their, for their careers and help them in this respect. And at, in this mix and from such a long experience, what would be the lessons that you have learned, the main of them, or what could you say it's, uh, let's say uh, the conclusion <laughs> of mixing all these uh, aspects of your career? Well, that is, uh, of course, a, a, a difficult question uh, to answer, Daniela. Um, I must say, I, I have been very fortunate uh, that I had the opportunity during my long professional career to be closely associated with many important regulatory reforms. I say it's a privilege because some of these reforms have had, and I can say that because there is evidence, they have had quite an important impact on particular activities or on society as a whole. And I, I will give some, some examples. I started my career in an area that nobody had expected me to enter into. Being a lawyer by training, it's strange that I started my, my career in accounting regulation. I was instrumental in the most important accounting reform that my country, Belgium, experienced last century. It's in the 70s. So for many of you, this is a long time ago. <laughs> but I learned at that time the importance of accounting. Accounting is the basis of everything. And in my teaching, uh, Daniela, I often made the comparison to my students between double entry bookkeeping, how boring, <laughs> and Greek philosophy, how exciting. There is no asset without liability. That is a life's wisdom which I gave to many thousands of my accountancy law students. Modern accounting is crucial. 
for the development of a sound economy. When I moved to the European Commission, I had the opportunity to reorient financial reporting requirements for listed companies in the di direction of international accounting standards. That has contributed a lot to making capital markets in the EU more efficient. I was also involved at the European Commission in audit reform and corporate governance. And I managed, and I'm still proud about it, to get an agreement on one of the most difficult files ever dealt with by the European Commission, the regulation of hostile takeover bids, which means basically to regulate peacefully a war between companies. It was a file that was so controversial that it is one of the, I believe still two cases, only cases where the European Parliament was incapable of taking a vote and where the chair of the Parliament, the chairwoman, refused to cast, to cast the decisive vote. So causing a renegotiation of the whole file. Now, I was still responsible for financial reporting and company law when a number of Central and Eastern European countries became members of the European Union. And I had the pleasure to be involved in the negotiations and had the opportunity to help a number of countries, and I think particularly Poland, in the transition towards a more modern accounting regime. That was an exciting experience. I moved to insurance and pensions rather late in my career. As often, it happened by accident. Nobody wanted to be responsible for an area which was considered to be very technical and boring, the most difficult one in financial services. Even though I did not have any prior experience in this field, I was asked to take on this department and to bring forward as quickly as possible a new solvency regime for the insurance industry. That was tough, but very interesting. If we had not started this exercise at the beginning of this century, we would have had a major insurance crisis when the financial crisis broke out in 2007, 2008. In that sense, it can be argued that Solvency II and its long time preparation saved the European insurance industry. As you said, Daniela, I combined my professional career with a part time job in academia. I have taught thousands of students from all over the world. My teaching areas were accounting law, financial reporting, insurance regulation, and solvency of financial institutions. I enjoy teaching because it forces me to fully understand the issues. This has helped me tremendously in my professional career. I was often referred to during the negotiations as the professor, because I used to start negotiations by a short lecture in which I clarified what we were going to discuss so as to ensure that all parties around the table were talking about the same subject when the negotiations started. Teaching has also learned me to explain a complex subject matter in terms understandable to a wider audience. I was therefore often invited as a speaker at seminars and conferences all over the world. I believe that I gave more than 3,000 presentations in my professional career, and it is not finished yet. Now, what I've learned, what have I learned from all this? A few messages. Take an opportunity when it presents itself and look out for such opportunities. Learn to work hard but make time for the good aspects of life. Cherish teamwork and do not try to do everything yourself. 
make sure that your staff respects you because you work at least as hard as they do and you give them responsibility. Do not forget to praise staff when they deserve it. They will do even better next time. Listen to stakeholders before starting to regulate. When regulating, do not believe everything industry tells you, but make sure to remember what they told you and remind them about it when necessary. Do not confuse business friends with real friends and try to keep an independent state of mind so that you can look at the mirror without being embarrassed. I've learned to, to appreciate insurance. It's very different from banking. It attracts a different kind of people. Because of the technical nature of insurance, insurers have great difficulties explaining what they are doing. This is one of the reasons why the important social economic role of insurance still remains one of the world's best kept secrets. I've tried to do something about that by making insurance more popular in my presentations to a wider audience and by encouraging students to look at a job in insurance. Many of my former students have now joined a group of chief risk officers, actuaries, and insurance supervisors. The professionalization that followed the introduction of Solvency II made this easier as insurance is now more attractive to young people than it used to be under Solvency I. And finally, I think that insurance still has a great future on the condition that insurers show leadership. Leadership in addressing the important challenges that will continue to preoccupy the next generations, as there are climate change, sustainability, aging society, health, natural catastrophes. There are still too many protection gaps that need to be closed. And my wish would be that the insurance industry, by showing leadership, will, better than it was in the past, be helpful in addressing those major challenges in the interest of society. Well, my wish for you is to see your former students uh, highly contributing to this goal. And uh, in this note, uh, what can I say? I'm happy that uh, I took the opportunity to, to start this uh, series of interview with you. Um, the person who mixed the lawyer with the professor and uh, with the good humor and uh, succeeds in uh, making a potentially boring discussion in a very interesting one. So thank you very much, Carl, for this interview. I hope we will have other futures opportunities too. And for our viewers, uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, interview. See you on YouTube for other meetings, uh, equally interesting with other people, other top professionals in the insurance industry. Till then, goodbye and stay close to us. <laughs>